We're back, talking about Cuba. Uh, 1960, to kind of recap, Castro's in power, begins to nationalize, institute a land reform program. Um, the United States increasingly puts pressure on him, <clears throat> begins an economic, uh, a program of economic uh, 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 strangulation in 1960, first banning all exports. Every time the United States takes an action, the counteraction will be Fidel looking for help elsewhere. Uh, if you have uh, uh, the United States screaming at you from, you know, 90 miles away, then you've got to find friends. And where is Castro most likely to find friends? The Soviet Union. So every time the U.S. puts the pressure on, then Cuba and the Soviet Union become a little bit closer. Uh, in fact, the U.S. ambassador to Cuba at the time, Philip Bonsall, in 1972, wrote a book. And in it, he said, Russia came to Castro's rescue only after the United States had taken steps to overthrow him. All right? And we can go on. We could spend a whole class on, was Castro a communist? Did the U.S. drive him to the Soviet camp? In the end, I'm not sure these are really terribly critically important questions. However, I mean, just from a, a perspective of common sense, Castro's a smart guy. He's a brilliant man, right? I, you know, it's not in his interest to have a blood enemy 90 miles away who can crush him while having to rely on the largesse of strangers thousands of miles away. In a perfect world, obviously, Castro would have much rather had a stable relationship with the U.S. Was that ever possible? Within the context of the Cold War, I don't see how you can say it was. I mean, from the moment he came to power, he was essentially targeted by the U.S. Three months later, in April, Eisenhower refuses to meet with him. In mid-1959, you start to see the exile groups in Miami coalesce and start to train. And by early 1960, the CIA is engaged in military training. So to suggest somehow that Castro was to blame for this, I think is really, you know, kind of, kind of a, a, a historical. We'll, we'll bring that up again. It's kind of ironic um, that Kennedy would uh, uh, assume this problem. Just as Kennedy had attacked Eisenhower and Nixon for the so-called missile gap, in the uh, uh, campaign of 1960 and during the debates, Kennedy had baited Nixon about Cuba. We have a, 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 an alien government, a dangerous government, a revolutionary government, just 90 miles offside our shore, and you haven't done anything about it. Now, Kennedy knew damn well, because he's connected to everybody, that the CIA was training exiles and that there were steps being taken, operations being planned to overthrow Castro. Kennedy knew that. But by challenging Nixon on it, what can Nixon say? Can Nixon publicly say, oh, come on, you're full of it. You know that the CIA is making plans to get rid of Castro. He can't say that. So Kennedy, once again, outsleezes Nixon. It's hard to believe. Nixon was furious because Kennedy knew. Nixon knew that Kennedy knew, and Kennedy knew that Nixon knew. So it was really, you know, kind of underhanded and deceptive. But that's kind of the way with Nixon and Kennedy. You, you kind of have to expect that. I always thought of them as kind of like spy, count, spy counter spy in a, you know, Mad Magazine kind of thing. So... Um, Kennedy becomes president, and the CIA tells him they can do Cuba like they did Guatemala in 54. So they target the Bahia de Cochinos, the Bay of Pigs, which is right here. All right. It's on the southern part of the island, away from Havana, where would be, I think, more likely to, for one to expect an attack. Um, Kennedy was uneasy about attacking Cuba, but he finally okays it. Um, Kennedy says there will be no direct U.S. military involvement. On April 17th, 1961, about 500 guerrillas trained in Nicaragua, Somoza dictatorship, American ally, head off for Cuba. Um, it's real hard to keep a secret in Miami. And so Castro was well aware of what was going on. And when these terrorists trained in the United States to overthrow a government, arrive at the beach, Castro himself is there conducting military operations. Can you imagine George Bush actually going to Iraq, throwing on fatigues and fighting in Fallujah? Probably not going to happen, right? Castro meets them at the beach along with the army, and they crush this Miami invasion all right, these, this invasion of, of terrorists from Miami. Um, 114 are dead, over 1,100 are captured. In the United States, there's a heavy fallout. Kennedy blames the CIA and the Joint Chiefs of Staff for giving him bad intelligence 
and for their flawed execution. In fact, Kennedy was well aware of what to expect. Kennedy had rushed this thing through because he was a cold warrior. He had to get rid of Castro. David Shoup, who was the Marine Commandant, in fact, had come into a meeting with a map overlay of Cuba just to show Kennedy how big it was, to explain to him how difficult this would be. Kennedy is well aware of the risks involved. It fails. Kennedy refuses to provide support, which was part of the plan from the beginning. So for the Miamis to say Kennedy sold us out, he promised us air support was wrong. You know, they expected these American jets to scream across the Bayou de, you know, Bayou de Cochinos at the last minute and save them, you know, like some John Wayne movie. That was never going to happen. Kennedy wasn't going to do that. That would have violated basically every U.N. resolution. You're invading a sovereign country. And, you know, with regard to Cold War, right after Khrushchev says, I'm going to support wars of national liberation, this isn't going to serve the U.S. well in the third world. If you want to look, I mean, there are many points, but, but clearly, you know, the U.S. role and the U.S. image in the third world is in free fall. in the Cold War. The U.S. had always been the beacon of democracy, right? Ho Chi Minh in 1919 wants to meet Wilson. In 1945, he's quoting from the American Declaration of Independence in the Cuban and the, the Vietnamese Declaration of Independence, quotes liberally from Thomas Jefferson and others. So the United States had always been the beacon of democracy. That's the country you set your star to. You know, you hit your wagon to the U.S. and you want to be like them. Well, in the Cold War, With the United States ousting Mossadegh and with the United States ousting our Benz and taking on Nasser, the U.S. loses that luster. And, you know, when it goes off on Cuba, you start to see a real global shift. And Mao and the communists really, by this time, dominate kind of the global movement for liberation. Even though Kennedy's talking about counterinsurgency and becoming a liberal force, in fact, Kennedy's actions, especially in Cuba, really mitigate against that. They're, it's really disastrous on, on many different, different levels. And, and the Bay of Pigs is really, I mean, it, it, if you sat down, I often say this about the current thing with Iraq, if you sat down and said, how can we screw up as badly as possible? It'd be hard to figure out, you know, to do as bad as, as Bush and Rumsfeld have done. In the same way, if you said, how can we really screw up in Cuba? You'd be hard pressed to come up with a worse plan than, than the way the Bay of Pigs came out. Kennedy, in fact, blames the CIA, blames the JCS. There's a real connection, I think, between Cuba and Vietnam, because after this disaster in Cuba, Kennedy, you know, he looks like a kid. He's, he's, only, he's the youngest president. Was he 42 or 43 at the time? Um, Cuba goes badly. There's a situation in Laos going badly. Uh, the Germans build the wall. I mean, he just looks like a kid. He just, you know, he's kind of being manipulated. He doesn't look like he has any sense or any footing in global affairs. And I think because of this, especially because of the Bay Pigs, he has to do something somewhere, and Vietnam becomes the place. In fact, Walt Rostow, his national security, who will become his national security advisor, sends him a memo saying, you know, after this disaster in Cuba, you know, clear-cut success in Vietnam may be a way to overcome that. So, I mean, I think there are others, McNamara and others are suggesting the same thing, that, you know, we screwed up Cuba so bad. We need a victory. We need to look good somewhere. Maybe Vietnam will be a, a good place to do that. That's a political consideration. I mean, that's not the reason the U.S. goes into Vietnam. It's much larger kind of a political economic program that James talked about with regard to kind of regionalism and rebuilding Japan and all that other stuff. But clearly, I think politically, Kennedy... It's, Bay of Pigs is a disaster. It's just, he looks like a chomp. I mean, it's just really a mess. It's a cluster screw up and everybody knows it and he has to rally somewhere else because the, the Bay of Pigs was a mess. After the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy pr program toward Cuba becomes even tighter. He, and the, the phrase you often see is tighten the noose. You, you see that all the time. JFK tightens the noose. Uh, they establish a full-blown economic blockade against Cuba. They remove Cuba from the Organization of American States. The U.S. invades a sovereign country, and then they get kicked out of the OAS. Not the U.S., right? They continue their propaganda. They continue to fund and support these Miami terrorists. Uh, they uh, plotted a lot of assassination attempts. I just have this. This is kind of fun if you have some time to kill. This is a CIA document in 1976. A senator from uh, uh, Idaho, Frank Church, actually created a, a select committee on CIA activities, the Church Committee. And it went back and found all these records. And, and, and this is a part of the Cuba report, but it's really something. Uh, uh, but this details what the U.S. did to try to get rid of Castro. I mean, it's, it's really like Rocky and Bullwinkle kind of stuff. Uh, aerosol attack on radio station. contaminated cigars. They were trying to, uh, uh, um, you know, they blow, his cigars would blow up and kill him. My favorite is the depilatory, 
they were going to give him something that would make his beard fall out so he would be so embarrassed he would have to resign, right? Uh, I, I'm not making this up. I wish I could, right? Uh, I mean, this is, you know, the, the, the lethal cigar. They, they detail the whole thing. Um, you know, lethal pills. Um, one came close. They, uh, every day at a certain time, Castor would go to a little, uh, uh, like a, uh, what do you call it? You know, the old Woolworths kind of things. Pharmacies would have little soda fountains there. And he would go every day and get a, a chocolate milkshake. And so the CIA got to this one guy and they gave him this, this little cartridge of poison that he was going to put in Fidel's milkshake. And so Fidel goes to get the milkshake that day and the thing was in the freezer. So it got stuck to the freezer. And the guy's over there trying to get it off and the Castro's bodyguards finally go and see that that's what it is. I mean, the Castro always said that was the closest he came. That was, that was the close one. Uh, another time they got to one of Fidel's mistresses uh, and uh, she apparently goes in and she has a gun and it's a beautiful scene right out of Hollywood. The way Fidel tells it, she looked at him and Fidel says, go ahead, kill me. And she can't do it and throws the gun down and runs into his arms, you know. I, th I think Meg Ryan is making a movie. Uh, I'm not sure, you know. Um, I mean, it, it, some of them are, you know, but I mean, they've detailed, I, they enumerate, I think, 30-some assassination attempts. Many ridiculous. Uh, another plot was to seed all the clouds above Cuba so that it wouldn't rain, so that the entire sugar crop would be ruined, right? I mean, it's stuff like this. It's really Rocky and Bullwinkle kind of stuff. And, you know, but, but if you're Castro and these guys are, you know, screaming at you, trying to kill you all the time, I mean, he's uncovering plots day in and day out. I mean, luckily, the Miami community is just really you know, kind of out of it, and then, you know, there's no secrets, so, you know, he has agents in Miami, and so as soon as something's up, he knows about it, and, and can take action against it, yeah. Was he taking these really seriously? Oh, yeah, of course he was, he had to. I mean, you know, we can make fun of exploding cigars, but for every exploding cigar, there was a real, I mean, there were groups infiltrating, there are boats from Miami getting into Cuba every day, they're sabotage, they're blowing up refineries, and uh, sugar, burning sugar crops, and things like that, I mean, there's some real damage being done. What did Kissinger say? Paranoids have enemies? No, he's not paranoid. I mean, he's, it's realistic. See, the thing about Castro, which is even true to this day, if you ever see an interview with him, the guy walks around the streets of Havana, you know? And so he, he, he never, you know, he wasn't kind of one of these guys under sea. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he took them real. He had to take them real. They were real. I mean, the United States, I mean, the U.S. violates pretty much every, everything on the books in Cuba from the beginning. I mean, this is... You know, in many ways, this kind of gets me going more than, than Vietnam does because it's really quite outrageous. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, you want to talk about, you know, terrorism and, 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 you know, aggression and all these, you know, highfalutin concepts that the U.S. likes to invoke. I mean, right here in one little country, you see it all. I mean, it, you really do, you know. Um, so Kennedy uh, tightens the noose. They're sabotaged throughout Cuba. They're skirmishes. It's... It's really quite ugly. From that point on, the United States is, is, is singular in its goal of getting rid of Castro. And in 2004, it's still singular in its goal of getting rid of Castro. Uh, I mean, Eisenhower was president when, he, when Castro took over. Boy, and he was, what, the, the, the 30, what was he, 31st president or something like that? I can't remember. No, he's more than that, 30... 34th president, right? Bush is now, what, the 43rd president, right? And Castro's still there. Back in January of 1961, Kennedy was saying, this is Castro's final hour. 43 years later, that's one hell of a long hour, isn't it, right? I mean, the United States has been singular in, in getting rid of, 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 of Castro and, and has not been able to and really alienated. I mean, the, the level of influence and prestige and goodwill the U.S. has lost uh, uh, is, is really outrageous. I think it's 10 presidents, yeah that uh, Castro's outlived, right? Um, in addition to that, I mean, you know, kind of the, the activity that the U.S. has not only turned an eye to, but actually sponsored in, in Miami is really incredible. I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of funny after 9-1-1, everyone talked about the Saudi connection to uh, uh, Al-Qaeda or, or Iran's connection to Al-Qaeda. I mean, the American government's connection to these anti-Castro Cubans in Miami puts all those to shame and blows them away. I mean, there's a direct link there, right? I mean, if, if Castro, you know, if, if the tables were turned, according to the Bush doctrine, Castro would have every right to invade Washington, D.C., you know, based on what the U.S. government has tried to do to Cuba, right? But it's just a matter of power. Anyway, you know, from that point on, I mean, you know, as far as they're concerned, Castro's days are numbered. Obviously, that's not the way it worked out. 
it's almost inevitable then, given those circumstances, that Cuba will become the site of another major crisis, and it does so in just a little over a year. All right. Um, throughout 1962, the Cubans and the Soviet Union had been having discussions about arming Cuba. Why? Because everyone in the world assumed that an American invasion of Cuba was likely, if not imminent. Why? Because everyone in the world assumed that an American invasion of Cuba was likely, if not imminent. So they're talking about putting nuclear-tipped SS-4 missiles in Cuba. Those missiles were medium range. They had a range of about 1,100 miles, which meant that they could have wiped out pretty much the entire eastern half of the U.S., killing at the time, I don't know, 75, 80 million people. Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, a real hawk, later said, they, they had in the 80s and 90s, they started having all these meetings between Americans and Cubans, and McNamara met you know, Fidel and others would all get together and they talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And McNamara admitted, this is the Secretary of Defense, if I had been in Moscow or in Havana at that time, I would have believed that the Americans were preparing for an invasion. This is McNamara saying, yeah, we understand, sure, it looked like it. I mean, in fact, they were, but you know. So. The military was in fact, the US military was in fact making plans to get rid of Fidel. In charge of this, which was called Operation Mongoose, was a guy named Edward Lansdale. Lansdale's a character. I, I'd like to tell more Lansdale. He was a knot. Lansdale was a psychological warfare expert. Like he had made his mark in the Philippines after World War II defeating, or in Malay after World War II defeating, no, it was in the Philippines, the Hucks, defeating a communist rebellion. Um, and uh, uh, Lansdale would do things like he would find these communists and he would kill them and then uh, hang them from a tree upside down and drain all the blood from them and tell them that vampires were there and that the, if you were a communist, vampires would, would kill you and suck all the blood out of you. It's goofy stuff like that. You know, I mean, it's like a lot of it was childhood pranks, putting sugar in people's, you know, gas tanks and things like that. One of his plans for Cuba was on Easter Sunday, 1962, he was going to have a hologram of a 100-foot-tall Jesus Christ appear over Havana to tell the people to get rid of Fidel. All right? This is the guy they put in charge of Operation Mongoose. The plan was to get rid of Castro to use U.S. troops. The United States was conducting military maneuvers off the Cuban coast and had actually practiced amphibious landings off a small island near Puerto Rico. All right? Castro wasn't paranoid. This wasn't a fantasy. This is quite clear. And when you have military operations in an, in an as part of operations in amphibious landing, you don't do that secretly. This is like the, the point of it is so that he sees it. They want Castro to see it. They want him to know what awaits him. <clears throat> this is an operation with 40,000 U.S. troops. That's not small. That's a significant operation. And it's to send a message to Castro. You know, we know where you are. We know where you live. We're going to get you. So Moscow and Havana, under these circumstances, what did McNamara say? I would have thought they were planning an invasion. Well, in fact, they were begin contemplating defensive measures. Tom Patterson is a good historian. He's written a book called Contesting Castro. And I'm just going to quote him because he says it way better than I could. Patterson says, had there been no exile expedition at the Bay of Pigs, no destructive covert activities, no assassination plots, no military maneuvers and plans, and no economic and diplomatic steps to harass, isolate, and destroy the Castro government in Havana, there would not have been a Cuban Missile Crisis. The origins of the October 1962 crisis derived largely from the concerted U.S. campaign to quash the Cuban revolu revolution and from Soviet-Cuban efforts to save it by deterring the United States through missile deployment. Why did the Soviet Union put SS-4s in Cuba? Basically to prevent the U.S. from overthrowing Castro. Very quickly, the chronology. 14 October 1962, American U-2 reconnaissance planes report that there are SS-4 medium-range missiles with a range of 1,100 miles, sites under construction. 16 October, two days later, Kennedy gets confirmation that these SS-4s are in Cuba and creates something called the XCOM, the X Executive Committee. By the way, this, this, uh, this is the image that Kennedy gets. This is a U-2 overflight showing the uh, construction 
of uh, the uh, uh, missiles in Cuba, right? Launch positions, missile ready tents, things like that, right? That's in San Cristobal. Um, Kennedy creates an ex-con, the executive committee, which is people like his brother, who's the attorney general, McNamara, Dean Rusk, the secretary of state, brings in some old, old kind of Truman era officials. These are like smart, smart guys. Dean Acheson's there, uh, Robert Lovett, you know, others. And they're going to kind of give him advice throughout this whole thing, the executive committee, the ex-con. Kennedy begins meetings on the missiles in Cuba with one clear mission, which is we're going to get rid of them. They will not stay. That's one kind of non-negotiable thing. We will remove them. How? They have basically four different ideas. Talk them out, negotiate. Squeeze them out, pressure. Shoot them out, war. Or buy them out, some kind of a deal. And they end up actually using a combination of one and four, negotiating and, and, uh, and, and a deal. The Joint Chiefs of Staff wanted to invade Cuba. They had tried that in April of 61. Didn't go too well, so Kennedy really doesn't want to hear that. Adley Stevenson, who's the U.S. representative at the United Nations, has a different idea. He wants to make a trade. He said, uh, have the Soviet Union remove these missiles from Cuba, and we will remove our Jupiter missiles in Turkey. Turkey, which shares a, a, a border, or real close to the border with the Soviet Union, had American Jupiters middle-range missiles there, which could have reached the Soviet Union. So Adley Stevens says, let's just make a deal. The Jupiters are old. We're probably going to get rid of them anyway. Like, it's an easy trade, you know. We get rid of the, the, the SS-4s are a far greater threat to us than the Jupiters are to the Soviet Union. So we went out. Let's get rid of them. Let's make a deal. Okay, this is Adley Stevenson's idea. Uh, Stevenson is basically rebuffed because that would be a sign of weakness, wouldn't it? If we make a trade, then we are weak. See, one of Kennedy's big things, which often drives him, is this concept, which is really kind of difficult, called credibility. All right? You can't really define it. It's not like, you know, McNamara. You can't put credibility in a computer, right? Credibility is the idea that your enemies take you seriously, and they don't mess with you, and your friends rely on you. All right? You don't appear weak. You appear strong. It's, it's kind of gangster mentality. It's kind of mafia mentality, right? People won't mess with you because you got street cred. This is essentially what Kennedy is saying. If we make this trade, then we're admitting the Soviet Union is basically equal to us. We're on the same field. We're doing the same thing. We can't do that. We must appear to be strong. We have to get rid of those missiles, and we have to let the world know that we did it through strength, not through a deal. They end up making a deal, which they keep under wraps, right? But credibility is more important than that, yeah. Do you, why was this, um, I mean, it seems to me at some point, very, very early on, there would have been the option to, to keep this very, very hush-hush. So is it made a public issue as a way, you know, to kind of sort of garner I, more domestic support and internationally I, for Kennedy? I, I actually doubt that. I, the international thing may be, on October 18th, uh, Kennedy met with Gromyko, Andre Gromyko, who was the Soviet ambassador. And he says to Gromyko something. He asks him kind of a, a vague question about Cuba. And Gromyko says, no, we're not doing anything in Cuba. All right. Kennedy at that point could have said, look, I have pictures here. What's up? He didn't do that. I don't know why. I mean, I really don't. It could have been handled differently. I mean, Kennedy comes out of this looking great. If you've ever seen, like, the movie that Kevin Costner did, I mean, the Kennedy brothers walk on water, right? I mean, the guy went to the brink of nuclear war, you know. Uh, politically, though, I mean, he, he had, was seen as having lost lives, having the problem there. Mm -hmm. The Berlin Wall issue and just getting stomped on by Khrushchev in Vienna. So yeah. wasn't it a face-saving deal? Well, I think, yeah, I think credibility. I mean, that's kind of what, what the point is. You, you say face that way, right? And, and, I mean, that's still, I mean, is it worth risking nuclear war when you might be able to do it behind scenes? You know, I, I, I really don't know why. I mean, he did meet with Gromyko, and he did not confront him. He didn't say, I have pictures here, don't lie to me. Or was it, and Dobrina in both, actually. The, the, Gromyko was the foreign minister, and Dobrina was the ambassador to the U.S., right? Yeah, I was just going to say that. It, it, it just seems like far too great a risk if, if you lose, if you, if you are forced to kind of concede. Domestically, I mean, never mind nuclear war, domestically, he loses everything if he's embarrassed having made this a huge visible issue. It could have done, been done quietly, I think, more successfully. And the Soviets, too, knew now that it's far, far more visible than it had to be. I think it's a and, huge and, and risk. I think to some extent, um, to a large extent, what? Could he be that 
Well, yeah, you could be that brash. In addition to that, uh, 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 the United States still has a, a fairly myopic view of the Soviet Union, even under Khrushchev. So I think they assume that Khrushchev won't, won't deal. Khrushchev, you know, remember what Kennedy said? The, the son of a bitch doesn't listen to words. He has to see you act. And so this is the kind of, Kennedy's a hard-line cold warrior. Pay any price, bear any burden, right? So he's probably assuming, look, the, the Kremlin isn't going to deal with us. We need to use our power. We need to use our strength against them. I mean, I'm assuming that from the beginning, that's kind of the, the, the operative idea that we can't, you know, really work with these people. We can't do it. We're going to have to, you know, do, do it our way. Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people. I mean, there, there's all kinds of psychological studies on Kennedy. Uh, uh, Richard Reeves has done a story, a study on character, and what's her name, Gail Sheehy and all these people. There's a lot of talk about, I mean, Kennedy, there's this element of machismo and ego and all that. Um, I, I personally don't do that kind of history. I don't, you know, I, I think that anybody who's president is going to have ego and is going to have this kind of, you know, basically this outlook on the world, you know. So uh, um, I, I'm not sure anybody would have handled it all that differently. You know, uh, um, you know it, it's also, you know, 1962. I mean, you know, uh, there's a, the Cold War is, is, is pretty intense, and McCarthyism hasn't been gone all that long. So, you know, if you're the president, somebody says, the Soviet Union has missiles in Cuba. You hit the roof and say, those no good, so-and-sos. We're going to get rid of those things. You don't think to say, hey, come on over. we got to talk. I mean, this isn't the way they do things. This isn't the way they operate. These guys are power oriented. They're, 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 there's a real sense of, of, of hubris, you know, that kind of Greek concept of excessive pride, because they are so powerful. I mean, there's no reason for them to think that they can't force the Soviet Union to get rid of these missiles. I'm going to push the... Like just this morning, I heard Cheney talking and he said, uh, like you say, the, the perceived weakness. He said terrorists, they attack our perceived weaknesses, not yeah. our right. how strong we are. Right. And you will be, if, if you, you know, and it's kind of funny because one of the lines of the inaugural was, we must never fear to negotiate, but we must never negotiate out of fear, right? And essentially, this is kind of, you know, we, we can't negotiate because we're afraid. I mean, this is, I think a lot of this is, you know, this is our credibility. We must appear strong because if, or if we cut a deal behind closed doors, you know, and other people find out about it, they're going to use that against us. We, we have to win. I mean, you know, we must win this thing. Because the whole world depends upon this system where we are relied upon to help our friends and hurt our enemies. It's credibility, right? Because if we don't do that here with regard to these missiles in Cuba, then they're going to take advantage of us all over in trade, in, in you know, nationalist movements, all over. Yeah. We had a handful of missiles pointing at the Soviet Union, correct? Including Turkey. Like spread throughout oh, God, Europe. Yeah. So, I mean, would that also be in Kennedy's favor? Because I, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's there's, already there's, got there's more guns drawn facing oh, yeah. him. There's an overwhelming, dis, di, you know, uh, inequality in power. I mean, the U.S. has you know 22,000 or yeah, 22,000 was it missiles? Or, or, so yeah, there, there's. I mean, for you know, Castro later you know has said it's a good thing you know because the Soviet Union always retained operation controls of the missiles. And Castro said, it's a good thing I didn't have control of the button. You know, I think that's just Fidel kind of ranting and raving. I mean, if something had happened, you know, granted, the entire eastern seaboard might have been wiped out. C Cuba would have been off the map. Cuba would not have existed as an island. And the Soviet Union would have been blown to sh smithereens. Khrushchev's not a dumb guy. He knows that. He, he knows that. And, you know, outside of setting those missiles up, there's no aggressive action, you know. And, I mean, you know, as, as Patterson says, as, as the U.S. ambassador said, as McNamara said, it looked like we were ready to invade. You know, every country has the right to defend itself. You know, every, you know, so, um, anyway, uh, 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 but, but Kennedy doesn't, doesn't handle this, you know, kind of privately. On 22 October, he goes on television, and this is, if you've ever seen a, a documentary, this is kind of when, oh my God, you know, this is when the country freaks out. He goes on TV to announce these missiles in Cuba and announces a blockade. This is the decision. This is the policy they agree to. A naval blockade of the Caribbean against any future Soviet arms shipment into Cuba. He announces a blockade. 180 U.S. ships patrol the Caribbean and B-52s we equipped with nuclear weapons uh, uh, fly uh, uh, over, patrol the skies over Cuba. Okay, 
uh, basically Cuba's just got a big bull, it's an island with a big bullseye that, you know, and, and it, it pretty, pretty clear. I mean, obviously the Soviet Union is aware. I mean, the, the, the U-2 overflights, uh, one was shot down actually. Um, the B-52s, you know, it's pretty easy to see, you know, no B-52 is hovering uh, overboard the patrol. So, I mean, clearly the Soviet Union is aware of what, what kind of a, uh, an armada basically Kennedy has put together in the Caribbean. So they, they would have, to, if they act aggressively, it would be with a full awareness that they were basically committing suicide. And Khrushchev's not a stupid guy. He's, he's not. Um, so on October 22nd, Kennedy goes to, goes on TV to announce this. Missile construction continued, but Soviet ships stopped in the Caribbean at that point. All the Soviet ships stopped when the American blockade was, had become effective. A few days later, on, on the 26th of October, a Soviet agent talked to an American newscaster, a guy named John Scally, who worked with ABC News, and made an offer. He said, we'll get the missiles out of Cuba if the United States publicly promises not to invade and overthrow Castro. That same day, Khrushchev sends a letter to JFK, and he says, these missiles are defensive in nature, however, we will withdraw them if you publicly promise not to invade Cuba. It's the same offer that they had made to Scali. Khrushchev sends a letter to Kennedy. The next day, on October 27th, the Soviet Union shoots down a U-2 plane, taking photographs of the missile sites. That day, Khrushchev sends another letter to Kennedy. This time, it's not quite so conciliatory. And he says, I want a quid pro quo on the Jupiter missiles in Turkey. We'll get ours out of Cuba, but you take yours out of Turkey. Kennedy and his brother say, we're going to ignore the second letter demanding the removal of the missiles in, in, in Turkey. We're going to respond affirmatively to the first one, which says, you get rid of your missiles. We promise not to invade. All right. We will, remit, we will remove our missiles. What, we will promise not to invade Cuba if you remove your missiles from Cuba. Privately, they make a side agreement. We'll also remove the missiles from Turkey, but you can't tell anybody about that. And if you do, we publicly disavow the entire deal. So they did make a negotiation. They cut a deal, all right? But it couldn't be made public because Kennedy would lose credibility, okay? The Soviet Union withdraws the missiles. Kennedy had stared them down. This is a huge victory for JFK. Uh, Khrushchev tried to turn it into a victory by saying, I saved Castro's government. He's not going to get overthrown now. But in fact, it was perceived as a sign of weakness, and he himself was, was uh, uh, overthrown in about, what, about a year and a half, in about 18 months. Uh, Khrushchev is ousted at the Kremlin, and ultimately Brezhnev comes into power. Um, what does that mean for U.S.-Cuban relations? Outside of a public promise not to invade Cuba, which the U.S. really probably couldn't have done anyway and gotten away with, not a whole lot. The so-called tightening the noose continues. And ironically, on November 22nd, 1963, does that date mean anything? What happened on that date? Kennedy's assassination. On that very date, a Cuban operative whose codename was A.M. Lash, I believe, met in, in Paris with a CIA agent who handed him a ballpoint pen, which was rigged with a hypodermic needle that he was going to use to assassinate Castro. So, you know, on the same day that Kennedy was killed, the CIA was beginning another harebrained scheme to kill off Fidel. You want to know why U.S.-Cuban relations are so rocky. If you want to know why, you know, some of the world doesn't necessarily take seriously American rants and raves about terrorism. You look at Cuba, where the United States conducted what can only be termed terrorist activities. You send a private militia to another country to overthrow it that you've trained and supported and funded, then, you know, how else is, are the Cubans supposed to look at that? It's funny, 1,100 of those people were captured, right? None of them were executed, I don't think. And, and, and I think all of them have finally been released. The last was released a few years ago, if I'm not mistaken. But it's kind of funny because the Americans throughout the 60s and 70s and 80s would often talk about how Castro was violating human rights because he continued to keep these people in prison, right? They were in jail. They tried to overthrow the country. <laughs> Can you imagine, you know, if, if, if in the, you know, I mean, I, I, it goes without saying, the kind of whole concept of universa universality, what's, you know, what applies in one place should apply everywhere is just kind of out the window. Yeah. Can you uh, just speculate on whether the, this U.S. aggression had kept, helped stay Castro in power? 
Well, it didn't hurt. I mean, it, it clearly didn't hurt. I mean, being able to, 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 to say, look, our problems are caused by this external force certainly doesn't hurt. I, I actually, well, go ahead. Well, do you know if he, if Castro what, initially planned to be a long-term ruler? Or? No. I mean, there's no evidence of that. I think, and I've had this debate argument with a lot of people, I mean, I think it would probably at any point have been impossible for Castro to leave had he wanted to because of that. Because any, any, any step back, the U.S. would have said, see, we, we beat him, we won. So they really did create an impossible situation. I actually think Castro was and remains very popular, you know, for the most part. I mean, they're clearly grouped. The guy's violated human rights. I mean, he's thrown people in jail for writing poems, you know, negative poems about him and stuff like that. At the same time, it's really hard to dissociate anti-Castro activity from Miami. Because in general, he's right. Miami is in there meddling all the time. There are operatives from Miami, from the CIA, meddling in Cuba constantly. And so under those circumstances, you know, it's real hard for him to give up power. And it's real hard for him to create kind of a more open society, I think, because of that. But, I mean, if, if you read, the old people love him. I mean, you know, every time there's a documentary or, or somebody goes to Cuba, several, you know, we've had colleagues and whatnot come back. The, the people who remember Batista obviously adore the guy because life is so much different. There's some, you know, kind of some of the young kids want MTV and, you know, Britney Spears albums and stuff like that. But, uh, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, clearly the U.S. attacks... Have, have strengthened his position in some ways, but I'm not really sure. I think this is a legitimate revolution. I mean, Castro often said that, you know, he, would, he was often very critical of the Soviet Union. And he, so he, always, he often said Eastern Europe isn't really communism. That was imposed. That was the Red Army that stayed there. He said in Cuba, the people chose this, and they continue to keep it in power, and that's why the U.S. won't get rid of us. We're legitimate. So, uh, um, I, you know, I, I think he's probably got a point there. I don't know. In one of his major points, though, that his security forces are pretty good. His security forces are very good. Yeah. You know. There's not going to be opposition. Uh, not if he could do anything about it. No. Um, no. I mean, he basically continues to insist. You know, uh, last year there was a so-called crackdown, and 80, 80 dissidents were thrown in jail. And uh, not just the government, but Western intellectuals and a lot of lefties attacked Castro and signed petitions against them and whatnot. What wasn't brought out was that those 80 people had recently met with representatives from human rights groups in Miami. And as far as Castle was concerned, that's fair game. You know, they meet with Miami. They're plotting to overthrow me. Uh, imagine if, if um, a group of Arab intellectuals in the United States had a meeting with, um, you know, Syrian officials, Syrian, you know, a Syrian government group. Uh, how would the U.S. respond? Well, we, we already know. We know what the Patriot Act does, right? 1,200, 1,500 Muslims are, and Arabs are, 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 are arrested. I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm not saying it's justified. It's, it's what every government does when it feels its inter, internal security is being compromised. Yeah. You want to push on that thing? I think those uh, meetings you were talking about with the dissidents yeah. happened at the residence of the U.S. ambassador, yeah. some of them. Yeah, they have, yeah, some of them did take place, right. The U.S. embassy was well aware of that and coordinating, absolutely. So, I mean, is Castro paranoid to think they're, they're, they're you know, because they portrayed a human rights group. That sounds nice, and, you know, how can you be against the human rights group, right? Well, they're meeting with Miami at the, the ambassador's residence, a government, the U.S. ambassador's residence, the, the ambassador of a government who's dedicated to getting rid of you for 40 years. I don't think that's paranoid, you know. I, I mean, I think, you know, the guy has been attacked and victimized so often. It's kind of funny, several years back, there was a, a so-called human rights group, uh, Brothers to the Rescue, it was Hermanos de, la, de los Roscade or something like that, which was shot down over Cuba. It was flying propaganda missions. It was releasing, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of papers, you know, get rid of Fidel, he's no good, that kind of, Fidel's a rat fink, that kind of thing, flying over Havana airspace, and finally the Cubans shot one of them down, right? And it was a big fear. Can you imagine Castro shooting down these innocent civilians in their airplanes? Again, imagine a, a Libyan airplane violating the airspace in Washington, D.C. What would happen, you know? I mean, it's, it's just absurd. I mean, the, 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 the attack on Cuba really, I mean, it, it gets to me far more than anything in Vietnam, really, you know, because it's just so outrageous. It's just such a consistent and harsh violation of this bullshit rhetoric about human rights and, and everything else. It's all you can call it. And it violates so many international agreements. It's, it's utterly terrorist to the core. It really is. 
I mean, you know, and, and, and the economic blockade, Jesus, I mean, to keep medicine and food away from people, you know, it's just, it's just ridiculous to have, you know, paramilitary groups training in Florida. Uh, in 1976, I'm on, I'm on another German's bomb, Pearl Harbor, too. In 1976, uh, a Cuban airliner was, uh, was hijacked and was actually blown up and 80 Cubans died. Uh, the guy who did it was a man named um, Posada Carillas. Posada Carillas was a terrorist. Uh, he was arrested and put in jail uh, in Venezuela. Um, I think the flight where he was in Venezuela, the flight was headed to Venezuela, I don't remember the connection. But he escaped, escaped with the help of friendly officials and made his way to Miami. Now, this guy blew up an airplane and killed 80 some people. There's really little question about that. Posada Carillas never really denied it. He was a hero in Miami when he got there. They had parades welcoming him because he had blown up a Cuban airliner, right? Now, what would most extradition treaties in international law suggest? What should the U.S. have done? You would have thought so. That didn't happen. Posada Carillas continued to live. In fact, he was recently arrested again for another plot to blow up to kill Castro. So, I mean, the U.S. openly has trafficked with people who were conducting what can, I mean, if you blow up an airplane and kill innocent people, I mean, by this 911 standard, that's terrorism, isn't it? The U.S. never took any action against Posada Carillas. And there's just like a, a laundry list of people like that. You know, so, I mean, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's just by this whole, you know, if you believe in this concept of universality, you know, what, what is applicable in one place is, is, is applicable somewhere else, then this should really be outrageous. And again, it's, you know, you keep hearing Castro's this, Castro's that, and there's no sense of the history of it. So, again, I spent a lot of time on it, but I think it's, it's useful. All right. Any, any questions on, on Cuba? Cuba's also, I mean, it, it, you know, as I said before, there are two places where American power is tested and, and is limited, Vietnam and Cuba. Uh, uh, and I would, I really believe that the reason both of these places American power fails is because these are legitimate, these are legitimate states. Ho Chi Minh and Fidel Castro have authentic nationalist credentials. If they were ruling simply by power and repression alone, they would not have survived. I mean, if you look at, you know, we can talk all we want about power. It's very difficult to maintain a state. I mean, North Korea seems to have done it, but for the most part, it's difficult to maintain any kind of a state with nothing but sheer brute force. Korea, North Korea has done that. Vietnam and Cuba don't. There is an authentic revolution in both of these places where people are invested both of these countries institute land reform, institute uh, 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 programs to educate people, to give them health care, to give them medicine. All right. So in that way, the people of Vietnam and Cuba are invested in the revolutions that they committed, which is why the U.S. can't overthrow them. And it's really you know, difficult for the U.S. to imagine how its power could not oust these groups. But in fact, it can't. Now, you know, if if Cuba was that easy to get rid of, they would have been gone long ago. Right. I mean, why has the U.S. hesitated to have done that? I mean, in the in, in the same period, it's gotten rid of Guatemala. It's done it in Iran. It's done it in Indonesia, done it in Chile. I mean, all over the world. Why not Cuba? You know, because there's an authentic an authentic revolution there that, it, it, you know, you know, U.S. can't simply march in and plant a flag in Havana, open up a McDonald's and a Starbucks. It's just it's not that easy. It doesn't work that way. Anyway. Yes. If. Castro does actually die one day. What do you think will happen? Just a prediction. Yeah, that's, that's always the thing. I, I don't know. I mean, clearly, I think Miami would be emboldened and try to do something stupid. And I suspect that the Cubans don't really want people from Miami coming in and running their country. So I don't know. I mean, right now, the, the plan would probably be for Castro's brother Raul to succeed him. There are some younger guys who are pretty dynamic uh, and who would be in line. Ricardo Alarcon, I can't remember the other one. One's like the foreign minister. The other one is the head of Congress. Younger communists. I think the Cubans would probably prefer to see them rather than Raul in power. It could, it could be very bloody. It could be very ugly. I, I don't know. No, there'll be a secession. Well, there, there are elections. There, there, I mean, communist, communist elections, yeah. I mean, they'll do that, but they're not going to have, you know, they're not going to let a, a people from Miami come and run for office. No, there's nothing like that at all is going to happen, right? any more than Texas is going to let Ralph Nader on the ballot. Um, no, there, there won't be any kind of open elections, no. There will be a succession. The communists will, will choose the leader. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay.
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, you know, the, the, the party has, yeah, clearly, I mean, there are, there are people there, you can pinpoint who's likely to, to, to take over. Yeah. Maybe he just won't die, you know. Uh, uh. He, I mean, I think his father lived to be nearly 100, if I'm not mistaken. I think his longevity is in his family, so. Yeah. All right. Following up, I think Cuba is, is, a, is, a, is really a, the, the kind of most clear-cut example. It's really one of the great, you know, kind of uh, uh, morality plays of the Cold War. And it really kind of exposes a lot of this rhetoric that we hear. But Latin America in general... I think is really kind of wonderful if you want to study the Cold War, if you want to study all these concepts of globalization and terrorism and, and rhetoric and democracy and everything else. Latin America is great. Latin America, what did Kennedy call it? The most dangerous area in the world. The United States will take a dual approach in Latin America, militarization and money, militarization and money. Right? And I want to talk about that. First, I'm going to talk about internal security military militarization by 1962 the Cuban Missile Crisis it was clear that the Soviet Union did not have the capability or really the intent to intervene in Latin America I mean they leave again when confronted what does the Soviet Union do what does the USSR do when confronted it backs down every case right because they understand that they don't have anywhere near the power of the United States a Soviet, uh, any provocative move by the Soviet Union of Cuba in October of 1962 would have led to the obliteration of those countries in addition to who knows what else. So the Soviet Union isn't really a player, although the U.S. will continue all the way through the Reagan years to talk about Soviet interference in Latin America. They know that that isn't the case. So the United States, instead of really worrying about the Soviet Union, is going to strengthen client states against internal subversion like Castro. Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, said internal security, not hemispheric defense, is going to be the purpose of American military aid in Latin America. Internal security, not hemispheric defense. What's internal security? Internal containment, though, right? It's not containment against the Soviet Union because they know the Soviet Union isn't really capable of doing anything in Latin America. And it's, yeah, against nationalists or communists or whoever. So it's internal to each of these groups. It's, it's how is this different than uh, 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 intervening throughout the Caribbean in 1915 and 1934? It's really not. It's, it's basically the same thing. What is the purpose of that? To maintain client states and to maintain an open door, to maintain economic activity. One major way to do that then will be militarization, military assistance. Between 1961 and 1964, the United States averages $77 million a year in military assistance to Latin America. That may not sound like a lot of money, but keep in mind, these are, these are friendly states with the exception of Cuba. There really isn't any you know, communist state in the region. In addition to that, that $77 million annual military assistance number is a 50% increase over the 1950s with Eisenhower. And by the mid-1960s, it's over $100 million per annum. So a significant increase in military aid to Latin America. In addition to that, the United States begins an intensified military training program. U.S. war schools, the most notorious of which is the School of the Americas, also known as the School of the Assassins. I have a link there if you want to find out about it. Begin training officers from various Latin American countries. They reserved 360 spots for riot control training. 344 for counterinsurgency training, 160 for psychological ops, psyops training, um, 77 for civil affairs training. An average of 3,500 Latin American officers a year in the 1960s train in America war schools with a peak of 9,000 in 1962, the year of the missile crisis. The most notorious of these was the SOA, the School of the Americas, known by its critics as the School of the Assassins. The SOA has trained 63,000 military officers from Latin America 
over the past half century. Included in this group are the most notorious human rights abusers in the entire region. The entire National Guard, the Guardia under Somoza, trained at SOA. The people who worked with Pinochet in 1973 when he overthrew the Allende government in Chile were trained at the School of the Americas. More recently, uh, uh, Vladimir Montesinos, who was the, the uh, main torturer in Peru under the government of Fujimori, trained at the School of the Americas. 63,000 people have trained at the School of the Americas. They have committed the most growth. The, 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 the government of Roberto Dobisan in El Salvador, which killed 80,000 of its own people. The generals in Guatemala, which killed a quarter million of their own people. All of these people were graduates of the School of the Americas, the so-called School of the Assassins. In the 1950s, in fact, SOI even put out a training manual on how to assassinate your political enemies. They made no bones about what they were there to do. Their goal was to train Latin officers to maintain internal security, which meant to use whatever means were at your disposal, including torture and repression, sticking you know, electrical charges to people's genitals, disappearing people, putting them in helicopters and throwing them, drugging them, throwing them out over the ocean, which is what the Argentine junta liked to do. All of these were committed by people who were trained in the United States, especially at SOA. Tell the families of those people who were attacked and murdered that that's not terrorism, all right? The United States also spent $50 million a year on Latin American police and training for police in the United States. In Brazil alone, for instance, the police in Brazil got 36 patrol cars. This is in the early 60s. 36 patrol cars, 52 Jeeps, 260 portable radios, 800,000 rounds of pistol ammunition, 540 riot batons, 122 gas masks, 20,000 gas grenades, 20 fingerprint kits, $137,000 computer information processing system. As Slim Pickens says in Stock to Strange, a guy could have a hell of a good time with all that stuff on a weekend, right? All that in one year. In 1962, Kennedy allocated $9 million for such civic action programs, 54 million eventually. And the most notorious institution was the School of the Americas. When SOA was started, one Latin American official said, give me the names of the first 60 students and I'll pick your presidents in Latin America for the next 10 years. This is a Mexican free. Mexico was always the iconoclast. Mexico voted against Cuba being removed from the OAS. Mexico was the only government to maintain diplomatic relations with Cuba. It's really ironic. I, I probably won't spend much time on Mexico. Mexico was, you know, because everyone talks about Cuban democracy, okay? Granted, Castro's been in power for 40 oh, some years now. Who was in power in Mexico from 1917 until, was it 2000? The PRI, the same party. Different people, but the same party. All right. If you know anything about the PRI in Mexico, well, a PRI president, Luis Echeverria, was just indicted for genocide, for killing so many political opponents. In 1968, the Olympics were held in Mexico. Outside of the Olympics, students were demonstrating and protesting. Perhaps 3,000 were killed by the security forces of Mexico. I often say this, and people look at me weird. The PRI is by far a more gross human rights violator than Castro could ever imagine being. The PRI has disappeared thousands, if not tens of thousands, of its enemies, maintained control in Mexico with an iron fist as the only political party for like 70-some years. If Castro ever did half of what the PRI had done, the U.S. would have invaded. Okay? Nonetheless, the PRI actually recognized Fidel. It's, it's a weird world, you know, it's a weird place. So this, this, you know, this Mexican official says, you know, the School of the Americas is going to train these people to become American puppets. Give me the names of these officers and I'll tell you who the presidents of Latin America. And he was right. If you look at people who led these military juntas in Latin America, nine governments were overthrown. Between 1961 and 1966, there were nine golpes, nine coups in Latin America, most of which were conducted by American trained military officers. It's not a coincidence. So militarization, again, militarization becomes a substitute for development. All right? Development. I put a question mark. Development, question mark. So the U.S. sends bullets, right? But it sends dollars, too. But does it send dollars in order to create a viable modern system to develop Latin America, to create a middle class, to create educational institutions or, or reform or modernity? No, no. There's a lot of government aid from the United States 
to Latin America. Some of it from government agencies like AID, the Agency for International Development, but mostly from global institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, things like that. USAID ended up accounting for 60% of Latin debt in the 1960s, right? You put them in debt, what does that do? When somebody's in debt to you, what do you have? You have control, right? The United States basically owns the Latin debt. In 1963, a report from a presidential commission on foreign aid said, although the U.S. cannot insist upon the establishment of our own economic system, the U.S. should not aid a foreign government in projects establishing government-owned industrial and commercial enterprises which compete with existing private endeavors. I need to say that again, okay? The U.S. should not, we can't insist upon the establishment of our own economic system, but we should not aid a government if it's going to establish government-owned industrial and commercial enterprises which compete with our private enterprises. What's that say? Are these countries going to be allowed to create their own development? All right, no, they will have to do it on privatized ways. In the United States, you know anything about America in the, in the 19th century? Do you, 1800, is the U.S. a world power? Of course not. We talked about this in the first class, right? The U.S. isn't a world power in 1800, right? What does the United States, when does the U.S. finally become what, what you might call a world power? It takes about 100 years, doesn't it? In the meantime, what kind of procedures does the U.S. take? What kind of process does it follow? It creates an industrial base. How does it do that? What does the U.S. government do to foster industrialization in the U.S.? Subsidies, tariffs, land grants, right? What, does it, does it uh, develop a free trade system? Is there free trade? No, of course not. There are massive tariffs. So other countries can't sell their goods because, you know, Britain is far more developed than the U.S. is, right? So economic evolution, economic history indicates that states need heavy intervention from the public sector in the form of grants or subsidies or tariffs or protection, something like that, right? What the U.S. is saying is that Latin America, which is in 1960 roughly analogous to where the U.S. was in 1800, isn't allowed to do that. We're not going to allow them to set up public institutions because they may compete with our private firms, right? Is that a legitimate program for development? No. It's a program for economic empire, economic hegemony, and this is precisely what it is. So the United States clearly is going to oppose socialism, but more than that, it's going to oppose any system which is going to use public resources in order to foster economic development. Why is it going to do that? Because they want to foster capitalism and they want to create a fertile ground for American corporate interests to come in and invest and exploit labor and get raw materials. This is how globalization inevitably is going to happen. Liberalism says we believe that we have to go in and foster development in these states. But if you do that, are they likely to do what you want them to do? No. They will develop public institutions. Everybody has. The U.S. did throughout the 19th century. What they're trying to do is say economic evolution doesn't count with you. We're going to skip that process. We're going to go, we're just going to skip it. It's kind of what the Soviet Union does with Marxism. They skip the whole process of industrialization, which is what Marx said was kind of essential to have a real communist state. They just skip that. They went from this feudal this poor, you know, agrarian state to communism, you know, and, and, and you don't, and, and in the same way, the U.S. is telling the Latins, you have to go from this feudal, incredibly poor agricultural state to capitalism. And in either case, can you do that? There are evolutionary processes which they basically ignore. American foundations begin to send millions of dollars. And remember, James said the Ford Foundation sent 35 million to Vietnam. The numbers in Latin America are probably similar. Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation begin to train and educate Latin American elites. They bring them to American universities where they teach them business and economics and things like that. They start to invest heavily. American manufacturing capital is particularly important. What is the hallmark of a modern state? What, is a moder what makes a state modern? Before mass consumption, what kind of production? Industrial production. I mean, it's really, it's really cut and dry. Indust modernism is essentially industry. I mean, the Industrial Revolution creates modernity, right? If a state is going to be modern, if it's going to develop, it's going to be independent, it has to have industry. It has to have manufacturing. All right, what was the Civil War? Remember the Civil War? You had industrial, industrialization in the North, not in the South, right? 
you know, agricultural states are not modern. They're not developed. They're not capitalist. Like by definition, that's not a capitalist state, right? So if you want modernity, if you want capitalism, you need manufacturing. Just they go together. They cannot be separated. They're inseparable. So if Latin America is truly to become modern, what would it need? It would need to develop its own economy, particularly a manufacturing base, wouldn't it? The United States in the 1960s invests about $4.5 billion in Latin development, especially in Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina, which are the three most advanced consumer societies in Latin America. This $4.5 billion is about a third of the total invested in that region. All right? So the United States is going to send $4.5 billion into Latin America to develop a manufacturing base. Is that going to be a homegrown manufacturing base? No, it's going to be imposed from the outside. 4.5 billion, that's what, what did I say, 40%? All right, no, it's a third, so the total is over $13 billion. Over $13 billion in manufacturing capital is invested in Latin America. Is it going to be possible for the Latins to create their own manufacturing base when $13 billion of foreign capital is coming in to do it? Can they compete with that? Can Argentina compete with the US? Can Brazil compete with Britain? Can, can, uh, can they compete with Germany? No, of course not. A good case study is automakers, the big three in the United States at the times, Ford, well, GM first, Ford, and Chrysler. Probably still is today, I guess. The big three actually restrict Latin American efforts to develop their own auto industries. There was talk and there were plans in Brazil and Argentina and Mexico to develop homegrown auto manufacturers, right? The U.S. actually works to restrict that. In the United States, the market for cars was, was actually declining. The post-war boom where everybody bought an automobile, you know, was kind of over. Everybody had cars now. In addition to that, companies like Volkswagen and Toyota are coming into the U.S. market. So American manufacturers are selling fewer cars at home. What do they have to do to make up for that? You have to find, go up, have to find new markets, right? Latin America is an emerging market. Emerging market, that's a phrase you often use. So the United States begins to move into um, Latin America. Uh, others do too. Actually, you know what the biggest automaker, biggest auto sale, seller, actually biggest automaker in Latin America was? Volkswagen. Volkswagen. VW sold more cars, produced more cars. Nonetheless, the big three in the U.S. Uh, 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 sold, um, uh, what accounted, no, 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 international um, companies accounted for 85 to 95 percent of auto manufacturing. So basically, you know, they dominated. They, they, they kind of were able to cut everybody else out. The United States controlled about 40 percent of that market. There was a 1.5 million unit market in Latin, 1.5 million cars in Latin America. The U.S. has 40 percent of that, which is 600,000, all right? Right. The point here is that the U.S. clearly makes a lot of money out of that. That's very important. But even more importantly, it restricts the ability of these countries to develop their own manufacturing base, which ultimately leaves them in what kind of a condition relative to the U.S.? Dependent. Bingo. That's the word I was looking for. Okay, if you've ever heard of dependency theory, Andre Gunder Frank basically argues that the goal of Western capital is to maintain a dependent system where these countries cannot develop and so they will have to remain dependent on the U.S. And this is precisely what you see. There's a really good book on it written by one of my colleagues, Tom O'Brien. Many of you have had a CIA course. It's called a Century of Business, what is it, a Century of Capitalism in Latin America, Century of U.S. Capitalism in Latin America. A really good book and I would, I would certainly recommend it to all of you. All right? So you have militarization, you have so-called development. All right? In addition to that, the U.S. tries to create an institution to uh, 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 conduct its policy in Latin America and that will be the Alliance for Progress. Critics would later say it was the alliance that lost its way. Any questions on what we've done so far? All right, the Alliance for Progress. There is clearly political upheaval in Latin America. Castro was all the proof he needed of that. Other countries are volatile. You know, keep in mind too, as I said, there were nine military coups between like 61 and 66. These are right-wing coups. Everyone, you know, I mean, it's easy to think, okay, the U.S. likes that. And in a sense, they're comfortable with it because these right-wing governments, they, 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 they passed the two tests, which are crucial, which would be, what do you think? They're, they're pretty easy to figure out. 
exactly, okay? They're anti-communist and they're receptive to American um, investment, American money, right? But does that mean the U.S. is all that thrilled with them? No, because a lot of these right-wing military governments, all these right-wing militaries, aren't necessarily advocates of human rights and democracy. They are not going to develop along the kind of liberal lines that the U.S. claims that it wants, per the open door doctrine. So even though it's certainly going kind to of willing to live with these countries, it's not happy about them. Kennedy once said that he saw various options in Latin America. The two big ones were Castroism, meaning kind of a communist nationalist revolution, or military governments. He said he wanted a third way, which was essentially democracy. But if you can't get democracy, if you can't get that third alternative, then sure as hell military governments are better than Castro. <clears throat> now this gives military governments great leverage, right? They can pretty much do what they want because so long as they can look at the U.S. and say, if you don't deal with me, the alternative is some kind of left-wing communist nationalist Castro revolution, then they get what they want. They can kind of do what they want. So there's really no pressure on these right-wing military governments to clean up their act or to reform. There's rhetorical pressure, but nothing real, because the alternative, Castroism, is much worse, and they're aware of that. So they can kind of call the tune, which is why Somoza and the Juntas, Castillo Armas and his successors in Guatemala, and the people in El Salvador, and the military governments in Argentina and Brazil, and, and everywhere else, they can kind of do what they want and get away with it. The U.S. isn't going to put any real pressure on them, even though rhetorically it will, and even though really Kennedy wouldn't want these kind of people. He'd prefer that they not be in charge, right? It would be easier if they weren't, but they are. All right, so there's this real volatility throughout Latin America, so Kennedy's got to do something. And this is really because of Castro. I mean, pretty much everything in Latin America is because of Fidel, all right? So in 1961, Kennedy helps, or Kennedy sets up the, the Alliance for Progress, the Alianza para Progreso. If you know Spanish, I think that should actually be poor, but whoever translated it in the White House at the time did it wrong. At any rate, the Alliance for Progress, the Alliance assumes, implies that it's going to be all these countries together. The goal of the Alliance is to invest $100 billion into Latin American development. 20% of that's supposed to come from the U.S., 80% homegrown. Now, from the beginning, there's a problem here, right? How are Latins, who don't have a manufacturing base, who are heavily militarized societies, going to invest $80 billion in their own development? If they had $80 billion to invest in their own development, would they need the Alliance for Progress? They'll, well, they'll have to borrow it. Right, right. And in fact, you know, this is the, the genesis of debt. Um, Latin America, as, a re, as, as, as kind of a quid pro quo, is also supposed to establish, and this is Kennedy's third way, they're supposed to establish reform, land reform, tax reform, socioeconomic reforms, so that this money could be wisely spent. The goal, per the open door, is still to create a liberal society, a society with a middle class, a consumer base, an educated group, professionals, right? Because that will create a far greater market. I mean... If you have a country which is considered third world poverty, I mean, you know, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Central America is incredibly poor. Most of Mexico is incredibly poor, right? If you want to go in and sell cars or sell anything, any kind of commodity, right, what will you need in those countries you're targeting? What do they have to have? They have to have the ability to purchase these things, right? Now, there may be enough of a, cl a, a middle class in some of these societies to buy a few thousand or maybe even a few hundred thousand automobiles. But are you really going to reach a mass consumer market that way? No, because these countries are too poor. Remember, one of the problems at the turn of the century was surplus capital was that most of the world wasn't developed enough to absorb American capital. Well, you're not that much better off in the 1960s. I mean, Nicaraguans are going to buy car? I mean, give me a break. They're eating rice and beans, right? Salvadorans are going to go out and buy uh, washing machines? Of course not, you know? So the American idea is to create reform in these societies so that they can actually adapt and, and, and develop middle classes, consumer classes, so that then they can actually be open to uh, uh, the penetration of American capital. This is the idea behind the... Uh, the Alliance for Progress. It is the imperialism of idealism. It is liberalism. This is what they're trying to do. They're trying to, to market liberalism to the world. But you can't enforce it, and the problem is that's the only way they can do it is through coercion. Because when countries decide not to do it that way, like Cuba, what happens? They're squished. They're crushed. 
Kennedy, under the alliance, wants to see a 5.5% annual growth rate in these countries. Kennedy calls for, and this is, this is ironic, this is kind of the commodification of, of language and ideas. Kennedy calls for revolutionary ideas and efforts. So Kennedy is saying, we want revolution. We want revolutionary ideas and efforts. It's, it's interesting that Kennedy can traffic in this language and these ideas. We want revolution, right? It's kind of like, you know, join the MTV revolution. Uh, there was a story the other day, I think I told you in the New York Times, uh, uh, guys in New York now, all these businessmen are wearing their shirts tucked out, and they said a rebellion in New York. A rebellion means you wear your shirt tucked out when you go to work at Dean Witter, right? It's a revolution if you watch MTV, you know? So it's this kind of reification of ideas and language. And Kennedy is calling for revolutionary ideas. Now, if you're in Latin America and you think of revolution, who are you thinking of? You thinking of Kennedy? You thinking of Castro, right? Yet Kennedy is trying to assume the mantle of revolution. This has a really different meaning in Latin America. Uh, Thomas Mann, remember the guy who said that I know my Latins well, all they understand is a buck in a pocket and a kick in the ass? Thomas Mann said the Latin Americans understand revolution differently than we are, than we do. I mean, to them it means you actually overthrow the government. To me, to us, it means like the Industrial Revolution, right? So, you know, Kennedy's talking about revolution. He's, he's talking about, like, opening up factories. The Latins, when they hear revolution, are talking about overthrowing this centuries-old feudal regime and taking control of their own societies. There's a little bit of a difference there. It's kind of like, remember, when they saw Pan-Americanism differently? I mean, to, to the Latins, Pan-Americanism meant we were all equal. To the U.S., it meant well, we're still going to tell you what to do, but we're going to do it, you know, without so much coercion. We're going to do it through the good neighbor policy rather than through direct military intervention. Kennedy said, and this is actually like kind of one of the more prophetic things he said when he was creating the Alliance for Progress, those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. And Kennedy in that regard was clearly a revolutionary. Kennedy and the U.S. are clearly, clearly helped folk, uh, foster the revolution. Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State, was similarly worried about what he called the increased pace That'll look good on TV. Dean Rusk was worried about the increased pace in the working out of nationalist revolution. Rusk is worried that nationalism, that the U.S., the tide is against the U.S., right? That, 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 that this whole idea of wars of national liberation are running against the U.S. Because the U.S. is not seen now as a voice for, for progress or for modernity, but they're seen as actually a counter-revolutionary force. That all these countries are, are basically saying, get out of our way and let us do our thing. And the U.S. isn't doing that. So the Alliance for Progress is going to be a weapon in fighting revolution in Latin America in order to put the United States, not the Soviet Union, not communism, back in the vanguard of reform and change. They want people looking up to the U.S. again, like Ho Chi Minh did, like, like Castro actually did at one time, as a, as, a, as a liberal agent for change. They want people to say, you know, uh, remember the America of the good neighbor policy. Uh, remember, you know, the, the, the U.S., the, you know, the kind of image of the U.S. helping out third world countries. That's the image they want, and they want to restore that through the Alliance for Progress. The Alliance was set up in 1961 in Uruguay, Punta del Este. The first task was to stabilize the Latin debt. Ironically, you know, who was Latin America in debt to? The United States. Why was it in debt? Because its commodity prices were so low. Latin America has several major commodities, okay? The most important of which is not coca, even though I'm sure in terms of statistics it's far greater than anything else, but the most important is coffee, okay? You also have sugar. Those are the big ones, fruit, right? But coffee is the key one. Commodity prices had fallen so much that, okay, bear with me. This is something we've talked about before. What is the key to economic stability per the IMF and the World Bank? What do they always tell you you need to do? You need to export. I think somebody said that. Good. You need export earnings. Okay, why do you get export earnings? Because that reduces your international debt, your balance of payments. If prices on key commodities like coffee are really low, what does that do to the domestic economy of a particular country? It means they're not bringing in enough money through export earnings, right? Coffee prices are so low, you're not making enough money in Colombia or Peru or wherever by selling coffee. So what do you do if you don't have enough intake from your exports? You borrow money, don't you? 
You have deficits. How do you pay off those deficits? You go to the IMF or you go to, the, to, to Washington, D.C., and you borrow money. So these countries find themselves increasingly in debt. Okay? Latin America is going to have to get its export earnings up. Now, the United States, how is it going to do this? It's going to have to do this. So the U.S. is going to have to subsidize them. Those countries, if they subsidize themselves, what would the U.S. do? That would be a violation of the IMF, right? If they subsidize their own industries or their own agricultural commodity growers with state money, that would violate you know, the IADB or the IMF. But the United States, through the Alliance of Progress, goes in and does it. So the United States actually begins to subsidize. The but who's it really subsidizing? Who's it propping up in these countries? The elites who own the land. Right? So what they're doing is essentially going in and propping up the big coffee growers and the big sugar growers and the fruit companies. And who owns much of this? Hmm? The banks. And which banks? American banks. The U.S. So who's actually getting the money? Is it going to the people in Latin America? The peasants? The people in... No! It's going to the landholders and to their own people. UFCO and the banks who hold the debt. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, it's, you know, brilliant, Right? So is the alliance under these circumstances likely to work? No. I mean, this isn't development. This is a continued dependency. In addition to that, militarization. Nine governments overthrown between 61 and 66 all combined to strangle the alliance. Once these military governments come into power, the U.S. has to recognize them because they're not communist. Okay? They're not liberal, but they're not communist. So the United States has to keep these friendly anti-communist in power, even though they're going to forsake reform. And the U.S. is going to have to reinforce these military juntas with hundreds of millions of dollars in aid, even though they're not going to create development because they're not communist. And as bad as they are, they're preferable to Castroism. In addition to that, aid, the Agency for International Development, is going to pay huge sums to UFCO and Standard Brands and other American companies in order to do engineering surveys and other kinds of development. At the same time, they will refuse assistance to Latin American owned businesses if they are in competition with US firms. It's kind of a welfare capitalist program for Latin America. Is it development? No. Is it dependency? Absolutely. All right. We'll pick this up um, next time.